morning. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. How is everybody? Okay. Today we have uh, an interesting talk. Uh, one of our own is going to deliver. It's going to be uh, very interesting. But before that, a few comments. First of all, I want to um, celebrate the birth on this day back in 1918 of Richard Feynman. And many of you have heard that name. Richard Phillips Feynman was an American theoretical physicist who was considered perhaps the most brilliant and influential figure in his field in post-World War II. Uh, by age 18, he had, age 15, he had mastered calculus. He took every physics course at MIT. And by age 24, he was the leader of a group on theoretical division during the Manhattan Project to define how much uranium you needed to actually develop an atomic bomb. So he shared the Nobel Prize in the area of quantum electrodynamics with a couple of other physicists in 1965. We also remember Harriet Quimby, born on this day back in 1875, who was the first American aviator, first woman, to fly across the English Channel. Many of you do not remember her because her this was not so much celebrated because it occurred just a few days after the sinking of the Titanic. And so she didn't get a lot of uh, press, okay? Uh, Herbert Spencer Gaser, G-A-S-S-E-R, died on this day back in 1963 at age 74. He shared the Nobel Prize with Erlanger on physiology and medicine in 1944 for his work on nerves and how he described in his team that nerves have different functions, that different nerves carry out different functions. Some nerves detect pain, some nerves detect temperature, and so forth. That was the work of Herbert Spencer Gazer. But today is about infectious diseases. So two things for you. Not too far back, 1995, scientists confirmed an Ebola outbreak in the city of Kitwit in Zaire. 50 people died at that time, about three nurses from Italy who had cared for the victims. But I want to pay particular attention to Baron Clemens von Perquet. Remember Perquet? There's a test with his name, and it's a tuberculin test. In fact, Baron Perquet was born this week in 1874. He was an Austrian physician who originally tested tuberculin for the diagnosis of TB. Robert Cook had actually isolated and described tuberculin from mycobacteria in 1890. And then Perquet started injecting it, detecting it that people who were infected had this reaction. And then Charles Martox, actually by 1907, had popularized this test. But one of the things that Perquet did was that he went, he was pediatrician, so he started testing children in Austria. And he was the one who published very early on that about 90% of the kids by age 14 had been infected by tuberculosis in Vienna, Austria in those days, it was early 1900s. So with that, I leave you with Dr. Julio Ramirez, who's gonna introduce our speaker of the day. Thank you. Then uh, the speaker today is uh, well known to all of us, uh, Forrest Arnold, uh, and Forrest came to us uh, from the University of Tennessee, where he finished internal medicine. He, we did a fellowship here at the University of Louisville in 2001. Uh, he uh, continued for 30 year fellowship doing research on antimicrobial stewardship, and then he has been the uh, director of the hospital epidemiology at this uh, university hospital for more than 10 years. Uh, uh, and even though Forrest, the primary responsibility is patient care, again, he runs the hospital epidemiology, the infection control, antimicrobial stewardship, and he's also very involved in clinical research. He has more than 50 peer review publications. And he's been uh, very active here at the university. And today, he's going to give us an overview of the role of the hospital epidemiology. Forrest, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that kind introduction. And uh, thank you all as well. I've been here for a number of years. And I appreciate working with each of you. And I think I'm a better physician because of it. With that, we will go on to talk about the role of the hospital epidemiologist. I don't have any conflicts of interest. We'll jump right into a case. 47-year-old female with a history of an MRSA skin and soft tissue infection of her left leg requiring a recent admission for IV antibiotics presents to the hospital with an abscess on her arm and is admitted again. 
she has had several abscesses since her last admission. She usually applies a warm compress and they drain on their own. One time she had to go to urgent care for an IND and she was released home. With her recent history of MRSA, she is placed into contact isolation. She decompensates after admission to the floor and is transferred to the ICU. Her screening lab in the ICU for MRSA of her nares returns positive. The Infection Prevention and Control Department has then provided audit information over the next several days regarding hand hygiene and compliance with contact isolation of healthcare workers entering her room. We do that right now with two methods. One is an app on the phone of particular individuals who enter that and watch us wash our hands and enter rooms with uh, gowns or not. And the other, uh, we are beta testing in three units with a thing called BioVigil. There's a sensor on uh, some nurses' jackets and one above the, uh, the threshold of the door. And if that's passed, then you have to wave your hand in front of it and it senses the alcohol saying that you've washed your hands. We'll talk a little more about that later. So who said to wash your hands first? It was Ignaz Semmelweis in the 1800s. His first job was at a hospital, and he noticed that there were a lot more babies, I mean, not babies, mothers delivering babies dying on the physician's side than on the midwife's side. So he tested his hunch and looked at the numbers, and he was right. The uh, mothers were dying on the physician's side uh, a third as much, twice as much, sometimes four times as much. You can see in 1945 in particular, uh, that was a bad year. Here we have 7% for the physicians and 2% for the midwives. So he thought to himself, well, what's the difference in these two wards? And uh, he noticed that on the midwife side, the, they would have the women deliver on their side, whereas on the physician side, they would have the women deliver on their backs. So, everybody on their side. Crunch the numbers again, no difference. So he said, okay, what else is different? Well, he noticed on the physician's side that this, uh, when a woman would die, a priest would walk down, around, all the while tolling his bell. So he said, you got to change your route and ditch the bell. So that's what he did, and he crunched some more numbers. No difference. So he needed a break. Jason. Okay. <laughs> anyway, he needed a break and uh, went to Vienna to look at some art. And uh, he was there a month. When he came back, one of his pathology friends had died. And so uh, he came to found out that the friend died from the same disease that the woman died from that was delivering her, uh, her baby. So uh, he made the conclusion, aha, um, we, we didn't know that this was transferable to, you know, men. So that must be cadaveric particles that was transferred from the women to the men. And so he knew that the physicians that were delivering the babies also did autopsies in that day. And so if they were doing an autopsy and then the woman went into labor and they ran over, they weren't washing their hands. So he said, wash your hands. And then their rates went down. So he found the thing that uh, caused these deaths and their rates uh, finally went down. Now that guy lived a long time ago. So we kind of need a bridge from that guy that lived a long time ago to today, and that bridge is Louis Weinstein. Um, this man is, uh, was key in infectious diseases. He taught generations of medical students. He was born before the antibiotic era, essentially. He wrote guidelines about antibiotics. He uh, preached that the overuse of broad-spectrum antibiotics is bad. He showed that you could have an infection, a secondary infection, because you're on antibiotics for a primary infection. He said that uh, you could, you could uh, make house calls, and he did. He had journal club on Monday nights for the medical students. In 1949 to 1955, he was appalled by the OB surgeons who would not deliver the women who had polio because they thought they'd catch polio. So he delivered them to himself. Quite a man, quite a man. And so that brings us all the way to today. And uh, who, is, who is here today? We have in our own division, Dr. Ruth Carrico, who's very approachable. I didn't tell you that Simmelweiss would berate his physicians for not washing their hands. 
and Weinstein was a little arrogant, would always try to one-up his physicians, Dr. Carrico is very approachable, but no nonsense at the same time. We all go to the CDC and the FDA to find their information, and I'm not trying to leave you out, Dr. Ramirez. The FDA and CDC comes to both of them for information, and we're happy to have both of them here in the division of ID. So the next epidemiologist is perhaps sitting right over here, and uh, they are going to build on the, the knowledge base and the good qualities of Semmelweis, Weinstein, Carrico, and uh, we'll see who that will be. My outline today is to talk about a multi-drug resistant control program, an antimicrobial stewardship program and an infection prevention and control department are key aspects of that. The strategies to prevent and manage multi-drug resistance, a literature summary, and finally an application. So let's talk about the multi-drug resistant control program. You have to have, to have a successful one, an antimicrobial stewardship program and an infection control program, and the hospital epidemiologist serves as the link between those two. So all this together makes a successful multi-drug resistant control program. At the UofL Division of Infectious Diseases, that's us, we go to UofL Hospital and the VA Hospital. So we have programs at both places, I'm the hospital epidemiologist here, and Dr. Bevan is over at the VA. Each hospital has its own antimicrobial stewardship team and infection control committee. And on those committees are various members of the University of Louisville Division of Infectious Diseases. Now, what happens at each um, hospital depends on who is in charge. At the moment here, you know, it's Kentucky 1, and we're about to regain control here d July 1st, so we can influence more what happens here. At the VA, there's a national mandate that happens. So there are some differences. For example, the signs on the doors of the, for isolation will look different at each hospital. And when in Rome, do as the Romans, and do what the door says, right? So let me answer what a multi-drug-resistant uh, multi pathogen is. You can have multi-drug-resistant, extreme drug-resistant, and pan-resistant, resistant to everything. The common examples are MRSA and VRE. And the CDC has rated these a four out of five stars for significant antibiotic resistant threat. So our MRSA rate is about here. It's uh, trending down slowly over the years. As you can see, it's still significant. And uh, our VRE is a bit lower. And some years, we've even, I mean months, we've even had areas where we haven't had any VRE bacteremia or infections. And so this, too, is trending downward, which is good. So the multidrug resistant pathogens that are given a five out of five stars are not what you would expect. Neisseria gonorrhea, C. difficile, and CRE. CRE is carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae, and these are uh, more bugs that you've heard of, E. coli, Proteus, Citrobacter, Serratia, Enterobacter, Klebsiella. What's not in this list are Acinetobacter and Pseudomonas. They have the resistance of their own that you're familiar with. So what is the prevalence of CRE at UofL? Well, I can't throw up a graph like I just did for MRSA and VRE because we don't check. But we have done a point prevalence study where we took uh, a day, usually uh, a week, and we um, had a study where we swabbed everybody in the hospital to see if they were carrying a CRE. So the swab is a perirectal swab, and uh, this is what it checks for. Multiple genes that carry resistance for CRE, a couple for ESBL, and the swab also had with it um, the gene for VRE, which is called VNA. So what we started with was 264 people in the hospital. When we approached two rooms, uh, the people had died, so obviously we didn't swab them. And we didn't go to the psych unit just to um, refrain from all the issues that might come with that. So there were eight other people that were out of the room. 26 people said thanks, but no thanks. And so we swabbed 214. So for a perirectal swab, to get 86% was pretty good for the hospital. It gave us some good information. 
So what we found, we actually had two CREs in patients that we didn't know about. They were carrying it and not infected. Seven ESBLs, which is extended spectrum beta lactamase, and two vancomycin, I mean 24 vancomycin resistant enterococcus. So the two CRE are the, the two most interesting patients here. One was a patient who came for urgent surgery and had been here for three weeks on the day that we swabbed him. And the other was an elective surgery patient who had been here for two days when we swabbed them. Now, if you consider this to be a floor plan of the hospital, let me orient you. Here's the elevators. So if you get out of the elevators and go right, you go into the ICU. You go straight, you go into the south wing, you go left, you go to the east wing. So this then would be the entire hospital. Ninth floor down to the third floor. And our two uh, CRE were located here in the SICU and on 5 South. If you look at just the east wings, you can see that they were uh, positive for anything tested. Three on 9 East, one on 8 East, two on 7 East, nine on 6 East. Most of, the, most of those were Van A's. And zero on labor and delivery. Then in the South, we had two on 9 South, two 8 South, one 7 South, two 6 South, two 5 South, and one in postpartum. She just delivered her baby. Then in the units, we had four in the SICU, one on CCU, and three in MICU. Two of those were Van A genes. So two components. I mentioned antimicrobial stewardship team. Let's talk about that first. Antimicrobial stewardship is a national term. The Joint Commission uses the term. It's not a U of L phrase and certainly not a Forrest Arnold phrase that I made up. It does make a little bit of sense, though. A steward, as we know, is somebody who um, takes care of passengers on an aircraft or a ship or a train, and uh, they are not in charge of flying the plane, but they are there to make life better for those who are riding. Now, an antimicrobial steward is someone who is there to make sure that the antibiotics are used optimally. Again, they're not there to make a diagnosis or fly the plane. They're there to make sure the drugs are used optimally. So these new guidelines are short, but they say a few important things. The hospital leadership is to establish antimicrobial stewardship as a priority, not just to say, ah, oh, we have one, but a priority. They also say that the team should be made up of infection control, infectious diseases, and pharmacy. We have them, plus we have microbiology, we have physician representation from the ER, from family medicine, surgery medicine, and internal medicine. We have nursing representation, and come July 1st, we'll have somebody from quality. They also say to educate the staff, and that is people who um, order the antibiotic all the way to give the antibiotic and then monitor the antibiotic. So anybody that has to do or touch the antibiotic is uh, to be given some education about antimicrobial stewardship and resistance. This is to occur at orientation, and then it says periodically. So it also says to monitor prescribing and resistance patterns and report information to doctors, nurses, and relevant staff. One way that we can do this is with an antibiogram. So this is an example from a year. It's ICU patients who are there for at least three days. And what it does is it, for example, collects everybody who had, say, E. coli. There were 73 of them, and 34% of them were sensitive to ampicillin. It says 94% uh, of them were sensitive to piperacillin tazobactam, and 100% of them were sensitive to amikacin. So this is good information to know when you're in a specific unit and you want to know what empiric therapy you might use. Maybe not just bank, piptazo, and levo. So the stewardship team is to use organization-approved multidisciplinary protocols. So it gives some examples. And one is the formulary, and another is the hospital guidelines for CAP, skin and soft tissue infection, UTI, and C. diff. So what's very specific to U of L or the VA is the formulary. Um, but what is not, it's no secret what's in our local guidelines for pneumonia or UTI because it's drawn directly from what the national guidelines say. So for example, if you write simple UTI in the record 
and then you, know, you proceed to give the antibiotic three, I mean the patient three days of antibiotics, and then you go to a fourth, that's going to prompt a note from the antimicrobial stewardship team who says, you said the diagnosis is simple UTI, we see the guidelines say three days of antibiotics, and they're on a fourth day. And then we'll give you a day to respond to that and see what happens. So the hospital is supposed to take action on improvement opportunities identified in its antimicrobial stewardship team. So for example, if we see the overuse of one certain antibiotic and the increase in resistance, we may make uh, a note that um, this antibiotic and disseminate the information that this is becoming resistant. Another example might be that uh, pharmacy and microbiology use a program called Theradoc, and that's going to need upgraded soon, and so that would be an investment to do that. They haven't made that request yet, as far as I know, but that would be an improvement on the opportunity. So overall, the goals of antimicrobial stewardship are to optimize antibiotics for patients, to be a resource to prescribing physician and record data, and then do what with the data? Well, to provide feedback is our goal. We've done that in the past. So one idea is to provide a report card. Who likes report cards? Nobody. But if it improves antibiotic use, then I'm all for it. If you recognize this door, this is the fanciest restaurant in Louisville, and uh, how do you think Edward Lee feels about, he's the master chef there, about this dorky, cheesy looking sign on the side of the door that says A. Well, he may not like it, but as a customer, if I was ever to go there, um, I really like looking over as I walk in and seeing that A there. So this example breaks down a little bit because I'm talking about giving report cards to physicians about physicians, not report cards to patients about physicians. But that's an idea. How, how would that go? Hello, ma'am, here's your report card. Looks like your doctor got an A for his antibiotic use. Well, good. Sir, your doctor got a C, but that's average. Here you go. Physicians to physicians. So let's now talk about infection control program. The epidemiologist is involved in a lot of things. The way it's set up is we have a department, the epidemiologist, the director, and at UofL we have three infection preventionists. We report to the committee, and the committee reports to the medical executive committee and administration. So we're in charge of reporting specific infections, MRSA, VRE, multidrug resistant gram negatives, and C. difficile. And then we also um, have to report specific infections, hospital acquired infections, line infections, catheter associated UTIs, and ventilator associated pneumonias. So the epidemiologist is involved in employee health. So occupational exposures to infectious agents is typically your needle stick or splashes. The epidemiologist will come and determine if that's been a true exposure and determine if the employee needs to uh, have HIV um, preventive care. Vaccinations, um, tuberculosis screening, and the epidemiologist gets involved when it's positive and they need treatment. Outbreak management, this is a very interesting part. If you remember the scabies outbreak we had among the employees after a patient was diagnosed, and then just be a resource to the employee health nurse. So we're involved in engineering as well, and we perform what's called infection control risk assessment, and we're involved in any kind of construction. It could be if a bed knocks the wall and puts a hole in the sheetrock, Engineering can't just come up and fix it. They've got to contact infection control first and get this permit, or it could be large in construction. Here is on 5 South where they're remodeling, and that sign is for nobody but infection control. It tells us that this is not just a vent that's blowing out all the fungus they have going on in there, but this is HEPA-filtered air to keep the rest of the hospital clean while they do that. You should recognize this is the new pediatric building that's going up. This is west of the hospital, which means that the wind blows from west to east. And uh, if you notice down here is a large moat of nocardia. And so our filters, <laughs> our filters have to be uh, managed well and made sure that the hospital air intake is not just uh, pulling all that in. 
So our intake is on the south side, fortunately, of the building. Here's the waterfall at the HCOC. This is um, tested regularly for Legionella, and it's not been positive. So any fountain like this is something that, that we look at. Infection control also goes to the operating room weekly. They check healthcare worker attire. They check traffic there. And we report specific surgical site infections. A couple of them are abdominal hysterectomies and select colon surgeries. So that goes to a national database. And then they, you know, they plot you where you are uh, along with other institutions. So I want to talk about strategies to prevent and manage multi-drug resistant organisms. Hand hygiene is the premier way, as Simo Weiss showed us, of preventing infection. So we're to do that as we go into a patient room and as we come out. There's two types, alcohol and soap and water. We have policies about this, and then there's a lot of education that goes on about this. So this is some of the feedback that I mentioned earlier. This is from the handheld device that uh, you can do on your phone, and uh, it's sent to us. This is four months of data. We have 1,000 responses. So those were 1,000 times that people were given the opportunity to wash their hands. Somebody like occupational therapy, physical therapy, they're pretty good, 97%. That's 167 out of 177. Uh, physician attending, 68%. There's some medical students, 73%. Oh, but the residents, 56%. Semmelweis would not be happy. And neither am I, frankly. This is from the uh, handheld uh, device that clips to your jacket and the sensors on the door. And really, I don't want you to look at all the busyness on this slide. Just one number, and that's right here. 27,000 instances where we could look to see when uh, people went in and out of the rooms and were supposed to wash their hands. Um, and that's from one month. Just one month and three sites in the hospital. And physicians weren't a part of that. That's why the... It was 97%. Anyway, um, there are different types of isolation precautions. You're familiar with most of them, respiratory, contact isolation, contact enteric, droplet isolation, containment isolation. I'm going to go through these. And exotic pathogens, Ebola and SARS. I am not worried about you all complying with the isolation precautions for an exotic pathogen like Ebola. Because number one, you'll be super highly motivated to comply. And number two, we'll, we will have room side education of anybody going in and out of those rooms, plus the CDC would be here telling us what to do. So that's kind of taken care of. The rest of the isolations, you have nobody looking over your back. It's just up to you and your conscience to tell you whether or not to do what the door says. So with respiratory isolation, it simply says to wear an N95 mask, and the main example here is tuberculosis. With contact isolation, we have the main ones are MRSA, VRE, and multidrug resistant gram negatives. Mark, why don't you come up for a second? So this is the sign. We have gowns and gloves, and I hear a lot of feedback about, uh, well, the gowns take too long to take, to put on. So we're going to have a, I want you to time me and tell me how long it takes me to put on this gown here. Just tell me to go. Hello, this is Dr. Arnold. That order's in, yes, yes ma'am. Okay, thank you. Let's keep going. All right, how long? 33 seconds. 33 seconds, all right, not long at all. So the gowns don't take too much time. That's good. Let's go to contact enteric isolation. This is mainly for C. diff, norovirus, and other infectious diarrhea. We have uh, purple signs for that, and the main difference is that you wash at the sink with soap and water to wash the uh, spores off so that you don't take those to your next patient. Droplet isolation, mainly for influenza 
and Neisseria meningitidae. The sign looks like this. We wear a surgeon's mask because the particles are large, gowns and gloves, and I've written arrows here to show that all these fall. So somebody that has influenza, sneezing, uh, it comes out, but then they're heavy and they fall. There's about a three to six foot radius of all this stuff around the patient. And so um, it's not coming out and it's floating down the hallway like tuberculosis. And that's why we take the uh, gowns and gloves as well. Containment isolation, these are for carbapenem resistant organisms, the most famous of which is KPC, Klebsiella, pneumonia, carbapenemase. Um, also, surgeon's mask and gowns and gloves. Another difference being that we use patient dedicated disposable equipment and minimize patient transport and call infection control before you um, transfer. Nobody wants to receive somebody with a XDR that's a, a surprise. So uh, some people say that uh, behavior modification only comes through prayer or suffering and nobody likes to pray. So we see that in our patients. A lot of uh, the patients with coronary artery disease, they start exercising after they have an MI. They, uh, patients with diabetes, they are start being compliant with insulin and their medicines after they have DKA episodes. Our patients with infectious endocarditis, tricuspid valve replacement is what drives the patient to stop using IV drugs. And our HIV patients, some of them don't start taking medicine that's paid for them and mailed to their house and one pill once a day until they have AIDS. Now we know that uh, there are many exceptions with with patients in all these categories. You have the patient who continues to smoke after they have lung cancer. So our motivation infection control to have other people use hand hygiene and um, isolation precautions is a bit easier because we're working with professionals. It's all of our jobs to do a good job at what we're doing. But our problem is whether we're working with patients or professionals is human nature to be selfish. So with hand hygiene and isolation, Many, most people wear that to protect themselves, which is only partly true. Consider the isolation type, respiratory isolation. Yes, you wear an N95 mask for yourself because that's how you get tuberculosis. You breathe it in, okay? Well, as I said, human nature goes against the golden rule, love your neighbor as yourself. What part of respiratory isolation is for your neighbor? And I say it's the ante room. Have you walked by somebody who's in respiratory isolation? You're in the hallway. The ante room door is open. The patient door is open. You can see all the way to the bridge over the Ohio River, which means that that negative pressure is interrupted and the tuberculosis is just wafting out in the hallway. You can smell it. So that's never good. We want to close up the doors. So with my team, to imprint this in on their minds, we all cram in the anteroom door. It's a bit uncomfortable, just for a moment while the door's closed and then open the next one. So they think, this is uncomfortable, but we're doing this for a reason, to prevent those outside from getting TB, because they don't have masks on. Contact isolation, we don't really wear contact isolation for ourselves. If you're not immunosuppressed and uh, your skin is intact, you're not gonna get MRSA. Now, having said that, um, if you have someone who has a large MRSA wound and you're changing the dressing and you can insert your gross MRSA abscess picture here if you want to, then obviously wear a gown and gloves. I say, show me someone who touches a draining MRSA wound with their bare hands and I'll show you someone who will live a lesson about personal protective equipment. I couldn't find anybody that said that, so I'm taking credit. So that what we do to this point is wear gowns and gloves to prevent our patients from getting MRSA and VRE. Let's look at contact enteric. Again, you're not going to get to a room of a patient with C. diff and acquire C. diff yourself. You you're, have an immunocompetent system, okay? It's to prevent it from taking it to your neighbor. So we wear the gowns and gloves to prevent taking those toxins to, to them who are on chemotherapy or immunosuppressed or have AIDS. 
And then we wash our hands at the sink instead of the alcohol gel. For droplet isolation, we do wear the masks for the reason I said. The whole way you get influenza is to breathe it in. And so the surgeon mask is for that. The personal protective equipment is the same thing. You can lean up against the bed rails, get that on you, and then if you scratch your eyeball or you don't want to take it to the next patient's room. So it serves a dual purpose, and then we don't want to um, infect ourselves or others. Then containment isolation, again, you're not going to get multi-drug resistant whatever uh, yourself. If you're immunocompetent, then uh, you're going to be fine. And it, the, the multi-drug resistant organisms are never going to be able to compete with your normal flora as far as taking over colonization. Um, but we do wear the personal protective equipment until we have data that tells us not to. Now, I started this section by talking about behavior modification. And I'm going to finish that before moving on to things. We all do things we regret and don't do things we wish we had. Those young in medicine over here uh, may be quick to blame the location of the alcohol dispenser or how dry their hands get with the alcohol or the smell of the lotion in the nurse's station. Those, and I won't say older, but more mature, um, will be more honest to blame themselves. Have you ever said, everywhere I go, there's always the same problem? After a while, you come to realize it's me. We come to the realization that we need accountability. I have mistakenly walked in a room without a gown before, and I know it'll happen again in the future. So I have instructed my team to immediately inform me when that happens. Throw me a gown. I can put it on quickly, 33 seconds. It's OK to speak words of accountability to those above you as well as on your level or below you and across disciplines. So nursing, OT, respiratory therapy, we should all be exchanging words of accountability. The VA has this poster. It's a good message. It's OK to ask if I've cleaned my hands. Finally, there's a posture that comes with maturity and behavior modification. It's the difference between willfulness and willingness. One says, I'm going to try harder, and yet we never achieve it. The other says, I'm going to be part of this policy, this infection control committee decision, this community of people to move forward. Part of the responsibility of the Infection Control Committee is to enforce its policies. Between the five of us over there in the department, that's a joke. We all have to be the enforcers through accountability, through example. Consider this view of a nursing assistant in the nurse's station. She's looking across. There's a physician there entering a room. Now, she has learned to wash her hands before she walks in the room. This doctor has no idea she's being watched. But the nursing assistant says, hey, I see that doctor washing her hands as she walks in. I'm going to do that, too. So let's move on to the last thing that epidemiologist does, which is an outbreak. And I'd like to spend a lot of time with this, because it's very interesting, the outbreaks. That's where you get out of the uh, ordinary and into something new. And uh, I'll just quickly go over the most recent outbreak we had. It was with a spine stimulator. Now, this is not a pain stimulator. This is a, a spine stimulator. It's to take somebody who's paralyzed in a wheelchair, make them stand, and finally make them walk on their own with assistance. The stimulator is put in the back, and the wires wrap around the side, and then the pulse generator goes in the abdomen. Well, here's a patient. You can see. It's a blurry, sorry about that. You can see where the uh, wires are in the, the spine. This is not a scar. This is cellulitis that has popped up exactly where the wires are, up to the pulse generator in the front. Um, so you can imagine that this had to come out. So when we work up an outbreak, and I won't go into all the details, but we do a root cause analysis and come up with different categories and then different items in each category, all to try to explain the reason for the outbreak, which is here post-op wound infections, and we come up with different variables, and if we had more time, I'd go over them, and then we make conclusions to the people in order to try to arrest the, uh, the outbreak. So I want to go back and talk about this circle right here, because I talked about using personal protective equipment if you have, for contact isolation, and I, I want to go over some of the data there. 
that's with that. So in order to do that, I'll do a literature summary. Now, after Dr. Roman got here, he was on service up in the ICU, and he asked me a question as I walked in there. He was like, what is the uh, data that shows we will really prevent infections of other patients if we wear gowns and gloves? And I hope I directed you to these following two documents, the management of MDRs in, from 2006 and the 2007 guidelines for isolation precautions. And for this lecture recently, I got in there and um, I tried to pull out articles. And what I found was there's not that many. And the only time that an article was published about contact isolation is when there was an outbreak. And when an outbreak happens, you don't just apply one intervention and then another intervention several months later. No, you just throw everything in there and try to uh, make the outbreak go away. And so that's what happened uh, with these early studies. And here are all the interventions, and just some of them actually, not all of them, hand hygiene, active surveillance of cultures, education, contact precautions, enhanced environmental cleaning, improvements in communication. So it was just a number of interventions that are all done at once, and then you don't know which one really helped, and it may have been a combination of several. So here's one example of uh, an early study. You see that there are two phases here. You had minimal isolation and screening and neomycin nasal cream use in 1989 up through 1990. And then phase three is uh, single room isolation and nurse cohorting, contact screening, prompt discharge of MRSA cases and mupirocin nasal um, cream. And then the rates began to fall. So that's good. And that's one that supports the use of contact isolation. You see that it's... Um, one of the several aspects that are thrown in there. Here's another article. It doesn't uh, support contact isolation very well, but it's early, and it was also referenced. This is uh, about VRE, and so this is people in an ICU that were positive for VRE when they got there. It's about same in both groups, and both groups are glove and gown, and then a glove-only group, so no gowns. So the acquired VRE in the ICU was about the same. This is statistically significant because the numbers are small, 24, 21. The negative for VRE enterococcus was the same. The acquired VRE after discharge, that means probably on the ward because they weren't discharged home yet, was approximately the same. And they spent, uh, had about the same amount of time until they acquired the VRE. So we're up to 1996. In 2000, you've got this study which shows before, they used no control measures, and then they had their outbreak. They start using single room isolation, and they started isolation screening, mupirocin. And then in phase three, they do everything in phase two plus. Well, they started washing their hands. That's a good idea. Education and feedback program. I'd be embarrassed to publish that. You, you'd think it was supposed to be over here. Anyway, it started coming down. Here's a, another article. Um, that showed that there were three periods. The first year was where you wear a gown, and the next period uh, was one year, no gown, and then six months where you went back to wearing the gowns again. And what they saw was that the VRE colonization went up when the gowns were taken away and went back down when they started wearing the gowns. Overall mortality stayed the same with the gowns, without the gowns, but then went down when they got to the third period where they were wearing the gowns again, and then any VRE positive blood culture was 4, 11, and 4. This was significant with this many uh, patients involved. And then VRE bacteremia was uh, minuscule, 1, 3, and 2. So all those studies led to a statement like this. No well-designed studies exist that allow the role of isolation measures alone to be assessed. Nonetheless, there is evidence that concerted efforts that include isolation can reduce MRSA even in endemic settings. Current isolation measures recommended in national guidelines should be continued to be applied until further research establishes otherwise. Well, here's some further research. Here's UCLA hospitals, and they had a time period before they stopped contact precautions and then after they uh, stopped 
contact precautions. So they used it here and they didn't use it here. They have two hospitals at UCLA. They measured both of them. They started one here and you can see the combination. The rates go up and down, but it, the, uh, it's about the same overall. This is MRSA. Here's their VRE rate, which is a, essentially the same as well. Um, they didn't use, I mean, they did use contact precautions and then here they took it away. So there's also patient care and well-being in contact isolation. Um, what they noticed, these three studies noticed that the tending is half as likely to enter the room if the patient is in contact isolation, which isn't fine if they have to be in contact isolation. Um, increased anxiety and depression score of the patient if they're in contact isolation. The patients had more preventable adverse events, greater dissatisfaction with their treatment and less documented care as well. So here's another recent study from last year that shows that outcomes of mortality, 30-day readmission, 30-day ED visits were all the same. But what was significantly different was the people that had isolation contact had a longer length of stay and they cost more. So now let's go to an application. As of this time, today, when you finish here and go upstairs and see your patient, we have contact isolation for MRSA, VRE, and MDR gram negatives. There's no contact isolation for patients with MSSA, vancomycin sensitive intercoccus, and sensitive gram negatives. So what we're going to change is move MRSA and VRE over to the no contact isolation. And that's going to be as of May 15th, Monday. Now what stays the same is that hand hygiene, respiratory isolation for tuberculosis, a new community acquired pneumonia admission still goes into respiratory isolation until they're ruled out for TB, droplet isolation, contact enteric isolation, containment isolation, Ebola isolation, it's all the same. Now to get this um, a good example, I have a religious example, so before you barrage me with emails for using a religious example, uh, hear me out. Um, if I tell you that I'm a Christian and I say, Jesus died for my sins, and I proceed to tell you, because I'm free, I'm going to go raise mayhem and commit adultery and fornication and embezzlement, then you would say, if you were a Christian or not a Christian, you'd say, I don't think that's what that means. Now, we're doing away with MRSA and VRE isolation precautions, and if you hear someone say, hey, they're throwing away the masks and they're putting all the isolation carts on the street, I hope you would say, I don't think that's what that means. And after this lecture, I hope you would say, I know that's not what that means, and don't forget to wash your hands on the way in and on the way out. So... In conclusion, we have talked today about a successful multi-drug resistant program. It encompasses antimicrobial stewardship team and an infection control program that are linked by a critical hospital epidemiologist. I've gone over some basics, hand hygiene, isolation precautions, some complexities of behavior modification, literature view, and data analysis. So I think I've covered all the objectives. I've even covered some religion. The only, the only uh, stone left unturned is politics. And so with this next slide, this lecture is done.
Right, those are required to, re to report. That's how science is done. And that's how clinical care should be conducted. Voice and please. So everybody needs this kind of program. How much does it cost the organization, the hospital, whatever it is, to have a, a cohesive, well-developed program like the one you have? Antimicrobial stewardship and infection yes. control program? Yeah. Cost? I have no idea. Okay. I don't do money. Does anybody <laughs> know? Do you have an idea? What is, in, in general, what Mark is, Pfeiffer is, might, is, yes. Is, 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 Okay, so I am, uh, things are bubbling up as, as he's talking. The antimicrobial stewardship team keeps track of the switch from IV to oral, for example, and uh, we have numbers from Jewish and from here, and it ranges from anywhere from like forty to $60,000 a month where you've switched because the oral is so much cheaper and people get uh, discharged. Now, we used to give an arbitrary savings for every day that you're discharged, you save $1,000. But that's an example I can think well, of. Well, I, I think the point I want to make is that these things seem expensive, but they have a tremendous impact, and you rarely spend the time measuring the impact to show that it's worth to sustain the temporary. Although, in our place, there's no concern that we use to sustain the temporary. No, we, we, we believe in this. No, there is a religion for it. Right, right. On the other hand, it would be nice to continue to do what we're doing, which is to do the objective part of it to say, no, 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 no. There's good data that says you make a big impact. Because as time goes by, and as the gentleman that you presented in the picture was saying in the White House for the next few years, each and one of these things will be tested. And it's up to us to show, no, there is no portion here. This is out. Question, sir. Yes. Right. It, it had a couple. Well, it is a vague term. I you've been questioned by the chair, uh, the chief of dermatology, well renowned Jeff Davis. You're right. Thank you for that question. Um, <laughs> uh, the term cellulitis is vague. It just means inflammation of the cell. Now, there were other things surrounding this, such as uh, there was an open area that had some pus draining out. I didn't go into detail. I, I do. I would like to talk about outbreaks a lot. She ended up having hers out, like I said, and I didn't tell you what they found, which the whole pocket was full of pus. But to have a contact dermatitis, that would be something to think about before you go to all that invasion, especially without it, you know, there's no potential for her to stand and walk like you're saying. Um, I also didn't say earlier that uh, people, for example, if they're admitted with a diagnosis that's totally not related to infection, say a seizure, and they come to the hospital, they have uh, they get hospital-acquired influenza, that would be a disaster. And if they die from influenza pneumonia, that would be a tragedy. So you're saving, I mean, how do you quantify that in dollars? I really like your show of how the community protection is not stopped or made for everything else. Yesterday, just yesterday, it was rock slide of destruction and a half cross patch with the still wearing a skull cap, still having a surgical mask and the suit. How is it disgusting that they're not grabbing something from wherever they came and causing food problems? Yeah. Shouldn't they be discarding all that before they left the room where you were living? Yes. And so they're wearing all of that while they're walking from the, the, the hospital A to hospital B, whatever. But what is a common person or a patient or someone who's just a civilian walking around full strength? 
Well, uh, they're, they're going to think, hey, you're bringing no cardio in here if they know that term. <laughs> but uh, you're right. That's not the policy. And um, some areas like that, if you know the person, I mean, you could approach them if you know them or not. But also, the Infection Control Committee is down here. We can be called, and then we can contact the person. Everybody is nice and sweet down there except me. So uh, that's one option. But you're right. It, he was not setting a good example, and that is not the policy. Yes. And I missed that when you were on. I don't know if it was a ring on or a watch. Which countries have now said they're below the elbow? Okay. And we know we had key culture, we had our lab coats, our neckties, underneath our wash stand. We can hand wash all we want. We still can't get it out for the ring or a long fingernail. Right. So what are you saying policy wise to go? Why do that total term now that it's bare below the elbow? So if you go bare below the elbow, whatever the top surface is, is going to get colonized. So if they're really serious about that, they should say, okay, scrub up past the elbow in between every patient. Um, you can't take off your skin. It, there's going to be a top surface, whether it's your arm or a shirt or a jacket. And then um, certainly we need to keep them clean. A coat cuff? Right, right. When I was a resident, um, a patient had pneumonia. I said, what color is your sputum? They said, yellow, about the color of your coat. <laughs> I'm like, okay, time to change my coat. <laughs> yeah, that's bad. Um, when, I can't give you a number of days you should change that. But we haven't gone to, uh, we're going to cut all, you know, make short sleeves for everybody. And I think it'd be impractical to have people wash up past the elbow in between every patient. We're just trying to get the hands right now. Right. There, it's too new to have good data. And then uh, sister institutions, there's some that are that have done this. Crichton comes to mind. And then the other big brother institution other than UCLA is Cleveland Clinic has done it for years. So other people have done it. As far as the guidelines are going to be updated, and I'll be curious to see uh, what they say there. These um, don't say steadfast you have to use isolation but they do recommend it in that 2006 to 2007. Uh, benefits other than de-escalating? Oh, no, I haven't, but I also don't de-escalate based on the nasal swab. Now, one, one reason, and it's not a good reason, but it is reality, um, this has kind of been tested already in the sense that people are, have not been real good about contact isolation for MRSA. I've been rounding with the ID team, and a nurse will walk past the team, past me, past the sign that says contact isolation, and march right in the room. And if they're going to do that then, I mean, you know they're doing it every night shift and day shift. Um, usually I'll, I'll confront them and I'll say, hey, you just walked past the ID team, the hospital epidemiologist, and the sign. Sometimes they're defensive and other times they're like, oh, I'm sorry, and they, you know, put their gown on. So uh, fortunately we haven't seen an increase in MRSA, if that can speak towards that. Uh, ours is it more, right, yeah, our rates are higher and our reporting is more robust and in a sense, um, 
it's just like uh, hate crimes. No police department wants to report their rape because then they get labeled as a, oh, the city of hate, you know. So a lot of hospitals don't want to report their infections because then they get labeled as the infection hospital. We are here with academics and the university environment, and we're very good about and accurate about reporting our rates. So they may be artificially elevated a little bit, but um, nevertheless, it's higher in a um, tertiary university hospital, yes. Okay, any other questions or comments? If not, thank you very much. And I'm gonna shake the ground on our time for our next 15 questions. Very good.